Hello and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, just pop along to patreon, p a t r e o n dot com forward slash the history network. Thanks to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network dot org podcast, season twenty nine, episode six. Royal Navy actions during the Battle of Britain, continuing a long tradition. This episode was written by Simon Keynes. Simon's father-in-law served in Royal Navy minesweepers during the 1950s, and his third great-grandfather was guarding the coast during the 1779 attempted invasion of England by France and Spain. He enjoys battlefield tours and alternative histories, and has recently retired, giving more time to researching and writing. Thanks, Simon, for this script. Ask most people about the Battle of Britain, and they will think of the Spitfires and Hurricanes of RAF Fighter Command in combat with the German Luftwaffe over southern England in 1940. History books will also mention Bomber Command carrying out raids on the French and Belgian ports where the Germans were assembling the fleet of barges and small craft to be used to transport German troops across the Channel in Operation Sea Lion. The Royal Navy, of course, were also on standby, waiting to repel any invasion attempt, but it is hardly ever recorded that the Navy also made raids across the Channel in September and October 1940 to attack and bombard these ports, showing complete control of the Channel at night time. They were following a long tradition of the Royal Navy taking the fight to the enemy coastline and ports. One of these ships had performed a very similar service in World War I, and there were three attempts to carry out a form of fireship attack which had worked so well against the Spanish Armada almost 400 years earlier. In July 1588, the Spanish Armada of 130 ships sailed up the English Channel. The plan was to sail to the Spanish Netherlands and then escort 30,000 soldiers in barges to invade England. The English Navy were unable to do much damage to the close formation of the Armada until they anchored off Calais to wait for the Duke of Palmar's army to arrive in their barges. At midnight on the 28th of July, the English Navy set eight fire ships to drift towards the Spanish fleet. The Spanish ships were all able to cut their anchor cables and escaped into the night without damage, but in the morning the armada was scattered. The English Navy were then able to get close to the Spaniards, sank five ships and damaged many more. A gale then blew up, making it impossible for the Spanish ships to get back to port so the invasion threat was over. During the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy frequently took the war to enemy coasts, as well as blockading their harbours. In 1797, the French attempted to land an invasion force of 15,000 men in Ireland in December, and did manage to put a small force ashore near Fishguard in Wales, so another invasion attempt seemed likely. A raid was made to block the port of Ostend on the 19th of May 1798 to prevent invasion barges being brought along inland canals and then reaching the sea at Ostend. 1,400 troops were carried in by the Navy to land and blow up the dock gates. The attack opened with the bomb catches Heckler and Tartarus, accurately throwing their shells into the town and harbour. Bomb catches, or bombs, were vessels carrying large-calibre mortars to fire explosive shells specially designed for this type of work. The troops destroyed vital dock gates, but unfortunately could not be embarked after a gale blew up. Ostend will feature several times in this story. 
In 1804, Napoleon assembled an army of 80,000 at Boulogne and talked about crossing the Channel as just jumping a ditch. In a stage-managed ceremony, all these men witnessed Napoleon awarding medals and they were supposed to watch a flotilla of new landing craft arrive. But just the sight of some British warships was enough to scare these craft into running aground, throwing Napoleon into a violent rage. The Royal Navy also attempted to float a stream of unmanned catamarans into Boulogne Harbour, each carrying 40 barrels of gunpowder and a clockwork timer. The Royal Navy also acted to avoid the risk of Denmark being forced into alliance with Napoleon in 1807. A fleet of ships bombarded Copenhagen while it was also under siege by 25,000 troops and artillery. Again, bomb catches were used and vessels firing the new Congreve rockets. These were very inaccurate, but could hardly miss a city. The Danes sued for peace after three days and surrendered some 69 warships and gunboats, so the threat of a Danish navy was removed. This attack against civilians and a historic city had been a grim necessity, with some similarities to the navy sinking the French Vichy fleet in 1940. The War of 1812 against America was caused by the British Navy attempting to block their trade with Napoleon's European Empire. Baltimore was an important American port, so again it was besieged by the army while the Royal Navy attempted to approach, which meant getting past Fort McHenry. On the night of September 13th, 14th, 1814, the Navy again used rockets and bomb vessels to try to force the fort to surrender, but it was too small to be targeted, so at dawn the American flag was still flying over the fort. The American National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, tells the story of that night with the rockets' red glare and bombs bursting in the air. The rockets were all fired from HMS Erebus, a name which will come again in this story. Another eight bomb vessels were built before 1829, but were not needed for war, so many were converted for polar exploration. They had been built very strongly to withstand the recoil of the mortars, so were well suited to ice. The new HMS Erebus was used in Ross's expedition, the Antarctic volcano Mount Erebus was named after it, but was lost during Franklin's search for the North West Passage. Moving on to the First World War, in August 1914, the German army attacked westwards following the Schlieffen Plan. A vital point of the plan was that the last man must brush the channel with his sleeve. The right flank of the army could reach the coast at the mouth of the river Somme, so that all the French coast, including the ports of Boulogne, Calais and Dunkirk, would be behind German lines. This was almost achieved. Von Kluck's first army reached Amiens, only 50 miles from the sea, leaving only the Belgian army in Antwerp behind their lines. Von Kluck then decided to turn south-east, aiming east of Paris to trap the remains of the French army, which opened up the French coastline again. The French 6th Army from Paris attacked their flank, leading to the retreat to the Aisne and the so-called Race to the Sea, the outflanking attempts which moved north to Ypres. By the 8th of October there was just an unoccupied strip of northern Belgium left, stretching west from Antwerp, the Germans finally focused on the Channel ports, so captured Antwerp on the 8th of November, then made a rapid advance west, aiming to capture Dunkirk, Calais and Boulogne. At this point, the Royal Navy could begin to give fire support to the army, using monitors, the latest equivalent of bomb catches. They were small vessels with a shallow draught, broad beam to give stability and the largest guns possible. An Allied flotilla bombarded German army units during the 18th to the 31st of October, east of the Isère River, holding up their advance until the Belgians were able to flood the countryside west of the Isère. 
During the war, 48% of all British supplies were landed at those ports of Dunkirk, Calais and Boulogne. The port of Ostend was just behind the German lines and was bombarded by Allied ships as early as October 23rd, 1914 to try to prevent it being used as a German submarine base and again in the spring of 1915. In October 1917, there was another bombardment of Ostend by the latest generation of HMS Erebus, a new monitor carrying two 15-inch guns in one enormous turret. During this attack, she was damaged by a German remote-controlled vessel, an FL boat, which was wire-guided with a range of 12 miles and carried a 700-kilogram charge. Onshore bombardment was always a risky business due to coastal guns, but this was an unexpected new hazard. And to the Second World War, in May 1940, the German army occupied all of Belgium and northern France, but there was another little-known operation carried out with Royal Navy help during this time. Teams of soldiers at very short notice, with no training, were carried over by destroyers to blow up oil tanks at ports all along the French-Belgian coast, sometimes under fire from the Germans, codenamed Operation XD. The Germans began planning for a possible invasion of England, aiming to land 67,000 men in the first wave. The Army High Command Chief of Staff, Alfred Jodl, called it simply a river crossing in depth, and some Army commanders had no idea of the hazards in the English Channel. There is a story that General Manstein of 38 Corps left his staff car on the beach until it needed to be pulled out of the waves when the tide unexpectedly came in. Barges were assembled in the traditional French and Belgian ports ready for an invasion, and RAF bomber forces made many nighttime attacks on them during September. The Royal Navy also began nighttime offensive operations across the Channel against this shipping, starting on the 8th and 9th of September. A total of two cruisers and 11 destroyers in three groups investigated many of the ports in poor weather. One group entered Boulogne Harbour and shelled the inner harbour. On the same night, three motor torpedo boats, MTBs, attacked a German convoy near Ostend. Then two of them entered Ostend Harbour and sank an ammunition ship and damaged another cargo ship. The captain of MTB-17 described the action. I went right into the anchorage, and there appeared the magnificent sight of twenty German merchant ships. At that moment the RAF started to bomb Ostend, and the AA guns gave us an even better view of our targets. They fired a torpedo only three hundred yards from the enemy target, and skidded around, then back round again to fire the other torpedo at another ship. For the next five nights, destroyers, MTBs and others patrolled the French coast and checked all the harbours for targets, shelling any targets they could see. Reports described the ships being able to inspect every port at will. Calais and Boulogne were shelled on the night of the 9th and 10th of September, and ports from the Meuse River to Cherbourg were shelled if any targets were seen. On the 30th of September, the old World War I monitor Erebus was brought back into service and fired 17 of its 15-inch shells onto Calais docks. Ten days later, the battleship Revenge fired 120 shells into Cherbourg Harbour. No Royal Navy ships were damaged in any of these attacks by coastal guns or the German ships. It is not clear how much damage was done by all these attacks, but they showed that the Navy dominated the Channel by night. The German Navy War Diary also admitted that units of the British fleet are able to operate almost unmolested in the Channel. One more type of attack was tried three times, but never managed to reach the invasion ports. Operation Lucid the Petroleum Warfare Department devised every possible way to use burning oil to stop a German invasion, including many weapons to use on land and burning oil slicks off the invasion beaches. The French and Belgian ports were to be attacked using four old oil tankers 
filled with heavy oil, diesel and petrol and explode them close to the ports on the incoming tide to carry in the burning fuel like fire ships. Churchill was enthusiastic and described it as singeing Hitler's moustache, a reference to Francis Drake's attacks on Cadiz in 1587, which he called singeing the King of Spain's beard. But these old oil tankers, of course, were unreliable. They made at least eight tanker sorties, but always had to turn for home due to slow speed or leaking or unable to sail in heavy seas. Historians still debate whether an invasion could ever have succeeded, but Churchill thought it would be so hazardous and suicidal that he approved sending three tank regiments away to the Middle East in August and Royal Navy operations away from the UK, such as the attempt to capture Dakar in West Africa and against Italian positions in the Mediterranean. HMS Erebus was used again many times during the Second World War, to support the landings at Sicily and at Normandy, and supporting the advance along the coast, including the Valcheren landing to clear the entrance to Antwerp in the last months of World War II. By 1980, in the defence community, there was a feeling that naval gun support, NGS, was a dying art, and ten tight 22 frigates were built with no guns at all. Other warships had only one four-and-a-half-inch gun, However, in 1982, it became a vital part of the Falklands War. Ships were sent in under cover of darkness during all phases of the war, from pre-landing bombardments to confuse the enemy, to close fire support to support the troops' advance. HMS Glamorgan helped in the battle for two sisters, but stayed in the gun line until daylight and was hit by a shore-based exocet. HMS Avenger was vital to the success at Mount Longdon, but many ships had only one gun, so when the gun on HMS Arrow was jammed for two hours, there was no support for the Battle of Goose Green. Brigadier Thompson regretted not using even more naval gun support for softening up before the land attacks, and could have used more guns and more ships. Naval gun support was seen to be vital again, as it had been, for many hundreds of years. Well, thank you, Simon, for that excellent script. If you would like to write a script for us, then drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org. And if you'd like us to think about covering a subject which you think we haven't covered thus far, then again, it's info at thehistorynetwork.org for that. So do let us know your ideas. And again, if you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, then please go along to patreon.com forward slash the history network, where you can find out all about it there. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the history network.org podcast written by Simon Keynes, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>